Welcome, welcome, welcome to Real Talk, Straight Talk. I am your host, Ivudi Bashengi, uh, and we are back with part two of uh, COVID-19, A Black Perspective. And as you can see, I have a special guest today. Um, he was here last week, but he graced us with his presence in studio, so I'm super grateful. Um, I'd like to present to you guys um, Medical Officer of Health, Chris Mackey. How are you, Chris? I'm well, thanks a lot for having me. I am, I am honored to have you here, um, being able to, to take your time to come and answer the questions to, for our community. It means a lot um, for us at the studios, but also at the community, so thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so I want to remind you all that you're able to chat as well as call in, ask questions. And again, we're talking about COVID-19, a black perspective. So uh, to start off, I want to ask you, um, what is your role and uh, what do you do at the health unit? Sure, so I'm the medical officer of health. So I'm, I'm a public health physician and I give medical leadership to all the programs that we operate. The, the Middlesex London Health Unit has a wide range of pro programs, most of, most of which have some aspect of prevention. So we have everything from uh, more typical public health programs like outbreak and infectious disease management, where we you know, support if a hospital or other facility has an outbreak going on, all the way to restaurant inspections, safe water programs, uh, we have home visiting support to, to new families, healthy babies, healthy children. Uh, we have a large uh, sexually transmitted infection program where we're you know, helping people to manage those infections and get treated. So a broad range of things. And I, I provide medical leadership and support to all those programs. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Kemi was here last week, um, who's the head nurse uh, at the Middlesex Health Unit. And she was able to speak about that program um, healthy babies, healthy children, and it is amazing. You have to look that up. And so um, when I was doing a little bit of research on the Middlesex Health Unit, I also saw that. So you did speak about prevention um, and you promote healthy living. And so when it comes to promoting healthy living and what means do you do that? Uh, uh, just when it comes to just even our, our, our community. Sure, so there are a few ways. First of all, uh, we try to develop government programs and policies that make the environment healthier for people. Uh, tobacco is a great example where public health was behind a lot of the you know, movement to restrict tobacco use so that it doesn't impact children, uh, so that secondhand smoke doesn't make people sick in the workplace, that sort of thing. Uh, all the way to enforcing, making sure that uh, people that are selling tobacco products aren't selling to minors. Uh, and then we also, in addition to working on the environment, trying to make it healthier, we work with people to try and help them to choose healthy behaviors, mm -hmm. whether it's exercise or eating well or, you know, taking care of your mental health, right, uh, right. all those sorts of things. Right. So that's where the prevention that you're talking about comes in. Exactly. Awesome, awesome. And so um, it also on your website talked about identifying the community needs. How do you do that? Sure, so we, we do it two ways. One is through what we call population health assessment. So that's where we look at all of the hospital records, all of the death records, all of the data we have about our community. And we say, what is it that's making people sick? So what are the major illnesses and what are the causes of those illnesses? So that we can try and address those underlying causes. So that's kind of population health assessment, a big overview of the health of your, of your community. And the other way is surveillance, which is more immediate, where we're watching for emergence of things like infectious diseases. Uh, but the overdose crisis is another example where surveillance has been really important. You know, with our partners, we can identify, is there a bad batch of drugs in the community that's causing a lot of deaths? Report out to the community, make sure people take, uh, you know, precautionary right. measures. Right. And how has the black community um, been considered when it comes to taking in this information, this data, this research? How has the black community also been, um, been taken into account so that you're able to better help our community? Yeah, I appreciate the question. We try very hard to identify 
at different groups that have higher rates of illness or of the underlying causes of illness, whether it's you know, uh, poverty or housing conditions or whatever the cause may be. And of course, when we, when we look at the data in Canada, you find a similar picture to uh, other places in the world like the United States where people of color generally uh, don't have access to the same healthy environments, may not have the resources or uh, housing conditions or jobs, uh, and so often experience a higher level of various types of illnesses. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have data that is as um, uh, high quality as in the US. There's a lot of gaps in the data here in Canada uh, because we don't routinely ask you know, about race in all of our healthcare data. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really have to try and fill the gaps there. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a big part of what we're trying to do. Okay. COVID is a good example. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna talk a bit more about that later. Yes. But we've seen here and in communities across Ontario that the rates of COVID have been higher in the black community. Okay. Whole bunch of factors, of course, um, housing conditions are crowding, um, you know, concentration in urban environments where we know that can lead to easier spread of the illness. Uh, often uh, frontline jobs, you know, grocery store clerk, for example, that sees a lot of people face to face every day mm -hmm. can put uh, people in uh, people of color at higher risk. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. So, and um, something else I know that I was looking at the website, it was talking about um, being um, in uh, working with uh, politicians and decision makers to be able to create uh, laws and guidelines um, so that we are able to have healthier communities. So um, in filling these gaps where you haven't been able to get um, the right numbers, the right information when it comes to the black community, um, and I know last week we had spoken about um, the this, this strategy that is trying to be um, created to be able to reach out to the, the black community. Um, so is that going to be taken into consideration in creating new guidelines, new laws, that bylaws that um, specifically affect our community? Uh, that's the intention, absolutely. And, you know, one of the other things that we can't get from the health data mm -hmm. is the values of the community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can tell you what the top 10 causes of death might right. be, but we can't tell you whether a death in an, uh, somebody who's elderly has the same value as a death in a young person, or, mm -hmm. you know, which of these do we believe are more equitable deaths and where do we think there really is an injustice right. where the black community wants us to do more work. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that because that means that there is pro progress um, within society that for a long time as black people we have been neglected and looked over and had to kind of like deal with um, the crumbs of uh, the different um, establishments that we deal with but here we are having a conversation with the leader, as we spoke of before, <laughs> and uh, here he is saying that he wants to know our values. He wants to know, you know, where is it that there are these gaps? What is it that we need help with? So that is why we should be um, definitely connecting with the health unit, making sure that your concerns, our concerns, our are heard. So let's get into um, let's get into COVID nineteen. Sure, let's talk do about. it. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to the numbers. You're saying that COVID-19 is affecting a lot of um, people within the black community. A lot of people are um, dying, uh, getting contaminated with um, COVID-19. So where are these numbers coming from? How accurate are these numbers? Because I've had um, some people like, hey, are these numbers, are they just saying anyone that gets sick um, and, has, and has something else? Are they just considering it COVID? How do you know if someone is um, actually dying from COVID or they're dying because they had a weak immune system? How, how, like, where are these numbers coming from and how can we trust them? Yeah, really good question. And there are lots of different parts to the answer. Let's start with where do most of the diagnoses come from? Okay. So uh, most of the people who are diagnosed with COVID get tested in one of the assessment centers. We have two large assessment centers in London. Mm -hmm. One's at Carling Heights Optimist Center okay. and the other is uh, at uh, Oak Ridge Arena. Mm -hmm. So that's where most people get tested and most people 
who test positive would be identified there. And then the other place where many uh, test results come from are healthcare facilities like hospitals or long-term care facilities. Uh, the testing that's done is standardized. It uses a PCR test, which is a genetic fingerprinting test that is very accurate. It is considered the gold standard testing. So if you go into the assessment centers, you get that gold standard best possible testing. Uh, the, the question of people who die with COVID versus people who die of COVID is, is another good question. It, it's a pretty broad definition. So if, COVID, if you test positive for COVID and it's considered to have any contribution to the death, for example, you know, if you die of pneumonia, but you had COVID at the time and it probably played a role, mm -hmm. definitely a COVID death. We've had other people who are positive for COVID, they get, you know, struck by a car mm -hmm. or may die of suicide mm -hmm. or that sort of thing. And clearly that's not mm -hmm. a caused by COVID death. Mm -hmm. And so those people But is get, that reflected within the numbers yes, or is it all absolutely. put together? Those people would not be counted if there's okay. a clear cause of death that's not COVID. Okay. Sometimes it takes a lot of investigation. We have yes. to wait for a coroner's investigation yes. to determine what the true cause was. But if it's clear that the person, you know, that died of something other than COVID, they would not get counted in the stats. Okay, okay, so we'll have, we'll talk more about that. We have a caller. Thank you for calling Real Talk Straight Talk. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Hello, good evening. My name is Star. Hello, Star. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I am wonderful. What's your question? Well, I, I, well, I have a comment and a question. Um, just one about the numbers. Um, as you were saying, the black community has been um, more impacted by COVID or there's been a higher infectious rate within the black community. But I wonder, um, my comment is, I wonder if those numbers are skewed because sometimes being able to go and take a test becomes a privilege when you're working, you know, on um, like depending on where you work and how much leeway you have with your employer to take that time off to go and get tested. Also, when you consider um, who has child care and who can pay for child care. So I do wonder if those numbers would actually, you know, are, are actually higher because I, and I know there's like a lack of confidence, you know, hesitation to go get tested and then lack of opportunity to go get tested. Right. Um, but my question was, and I'm not sure if you're able to answer, um, but my question was um, about the vaccine because I uh, there was a pop-up clinic. I live in Toronto. There was a pop-up clinic in um, uh, at a, a Caribbean um, uh, community center, and so there was a pop-up there, and you know I was headed like unfortunately I couldn't get the vaccine. Um, I they ran out, but I was heading there, and I had I was so nervous about about the vaccine because, um, you know, I was wondering about the trials and whether, you know, are we were we included in in like during that the, the clinical trial? Yeah. So I wonder, is it like is it possible that vaccines would have possibly different effects on black bodies than? than what I'm assuming were white bodies that were, you know, in the, the clinical trial process. So some great points. Uh, first of all, on the, on the data question, when we were able to gather data here in Middlesex and London, what we found is that the rate of COVID was about 20 to 30% higher among people of color. Other studies have shown even higher. If uh, Public Health Ontario looked across the province and they found that uh, communities with higher uh, ethnic diversity were, were overrepresented by a factor of three to four in terms of both hospitalizations and deaths. So really a tragic impact there. And I think you're absolutely right, Star, that the, uh, the numbers coming from the testing centers probably underestimated that because there are barriers to many people being tested. On the research on the vaccines, uh, the, there is lots of experience in people of color, uh, well represented in the study populations. The two main studies for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine each had about 40,000 participants, and those were from US, Brazil, and uh, I believe Germany was a third country. But you, you had a lot of ethnic diversity in the US sample as well as the Brazilian sample. 
uh, enough to say that there was definitely as good or better of an effect with the vaccines in people of color. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's uh, as I compile, you know, information and, you know, about my decision on whether to get the vaccine, what you said is definitely very helpful. I'm really happy and, to hear that, Star. And then I guess um, I did have one other question is, have you noticed that uh, across, you know, different races, whether like there are differences in symptoms? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, not, I'm not aware of a lot of systema systematically gathered data showing that there was different impacts. Uh, there are certain uh, genetic issues that may be more prevalent in one, uh, in one population than another around how the immune system reacts. But uh, as far as I know, there isn't a lot of good data to say that an individual case in a person of color uh, would be any different than uh, someone who were white or Asian. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Star. Those are very good questions. So since we already are on the topic of the vaccine, let's just get right into it. So what are our options when it comes to um, getting the vaccine? What are the different vaccines that are available? So right now, just two, and, and that's actually because there was an announcement today mm -hmm. that the government's gonna pause the third vaccine, AstraZeneca. Okay. Uh, they have had some cases of the blood clots in Ontario. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very uncommon, still in the range of one in 100,000 vaccinees, right. but they've decided that now there's enough Pfizer and Moderna that they're gonna put the AstraZeneca on hold for now. Okay. So those are your options, and the two vaccines are very similar, almost identical. They're both what they call mRNA vaccines. So messenger RNA is the technology that's used for Pfizer and Moderna. Mm -hmm. And their study results are very similar. Mm -hmm. Both, even after one dose, both of them are around 90% effective. The second dose is mostly for maintaining the immunity longer. Uh, both ha can generate, you know, headaches, sore muscles, uh, fever, that sort of thing. But it generally passes within a day or two. Um, otherwise, excellent vaccines. Okay, um, and so are those the only side effects when it comes to um, both those vaccines? I know there's been a lot of talk about it, uh, vaccine changing your DNA, um, others about like just a lot of different things going on. Are those the only things that, um, uh, that are when it comes to symptoms of taking the vaccine? Yeah, so for the two mRNA vaccines, the, the main side effects are, you know, fever, sore muscles, that sort of thing. Uh, the, the, the mRNA vaccines do not change your DNA. Okay. Uh, they do not, uh, you know, some people have, uh, have said that they want to get, you know, some kind of superhuman DNA out of this. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't change right, your DNA, right. it doesn't Where cause. do you think that comes from? Where do you think that, the, the, where did this come from, this whole idea of it? Why do people think that it would change your DNA? Yeah, well, so the messenger RNA is a, is like, is a genetic material. Our okay. RNA is like what viruses use for their DNA right. instead of DNA. And so the process does use that RNA to signal to your cell what to react to. Okay. Uh, so that may be where it's coming from. But there's no evidence of that. And again, these studies had 40,000 people in them. They looked very mm -hmm. carefully for any kind of serious side effects. Didn't okay. really see any. Okay, thank you. So we have another caller. I'm not on. Thank, you for, thank you for calling Real Talk Straight Talk. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, hello, good evening, how are you? I'm wonderful, thank you, how are you? I'm all right. Awesome, um, what's your question? What's the question? Or well, comment. <laughs> um, what's my question? My question is, um, is, these, is the vaccine, um, the first shot, is it, is it the vaccine when you take the vaccine? Is it uh, make you immune? And which one of the vaccines is the better one to take? Yeah, great questions. Uh, the two that we're, that we're offering now, the Pfizer and Moderna, are both top of the line. Some people have argued that they're slightly better than AstraZeneca. I would still say if you get a chance to take that third one, take it. Johnson Johnson is another one we'll have access to 
soon that's similar to AstraZeneca. But Pfizer and Moderna, definitely top of the line vaccines. If you can get them, that's where you should go for sure. And uh, I, I'm not, sorry, I might have missed part the of the- second one, he said, um, it, does it build your immunity? Yeah, and yeah, I'll yeah. even add, how does it work? Sure, sure. Okay, so the, the, uh, the typical vaccine helps your body to develop antibodies. So an antibody, the, the virus has these particles and the antibodies are the ones that grab onto the particles so that they can't enter into the cell. So they just kind of mm. neutralize the virus. And most of your body's immune system is around antibodies. Uh, those are easy to measure in the blood. So when they do the studies, you, they, they'll give the people vaccine and then they'll test their antibodies and make sure they're generating antibodies. And if they have, that's a good sign there'll be protection. Uh, the other way is through something called cellular immunity. So you've got these cells on top of the antibodies, which are pro basically proteins mm -hmm. that go around kind of covering the, vaccine, the virus. The, there are cells in your blood, white blood cells, uh, T cells and B cells, and the, the, anti, uh, the, vir the vaccine can help those cells, the T and B cells, to identify the virus and fight them directly cell to cell. Mm -hmm. And so T cells in particular are part of the immune response. They're harder to measure. Antibodies you can check in blood easy, easily. Mm -hmm. uh, but T cells, even when you don't have antibody reaction, sometimes the T cells can be enough to generate immunity. And absolutely, these two vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, are fantastic at generating that kind of immunity. Oh, that was a great explanation. I almost feel like we needed a whiteboard <laughs> to draw that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have a question. Um, what are the, um, through the studies that they've been doing lately, I have not heard anyone talk about the, um, the side effects. Right. Um, with the studies that's going on, do you know what are the major side effects and what are the ups and the downs from taking uh, from taking the vaccine? Yeah, great question. So most of the side effects are the sorts of side effects that you would get from getting a cold, uh, where really it's your body's immune reaction that is causing the symptoms. And that's actually what we want. We want your body reacting to the vaccine. That's a sign that you're developing immunity and you know your body's learning to fight this off. So things like headache, fever, uh, joint pain, muscle pain, feeling tired you are, are, are pretty common, up to 50% of people, especially after the second dose, not as much after the first dose. Uh, and then you know they'll, they'll peak on day two, so day one tends to be not much. Day two, you might feel pretty rough. By day three or four, those side effects are passed. There are no serious side effects with Pfizer or Moderna. We have seen some uh, allergic reactions. Mm -hmm. The same way somebody might get an allergic reaction to a bee sting. Okay. You've seen that in a very small number of people. That's why when you get the vaccine, you've got to stay in the clinic for at least 15 minutes afterwards. Oh. We don't send people out. And you know, if you're, if you're coming for an appointment, you can plan for that. Mm -hmm. You'll be there for at least 15 minutes after you get the shot mm -hmm. so that the nurses and the paramedics who are there can help anybody that has any kind of allergic reaction. And do okay. We... <clears throat> now my next question is: um, <laughs> If someone have epilepsy, are they allowed to have the vaccine, or would that mm -hmm. be um, a countermeasure when they, if they take the vaccine, would that affect them in any which way if they have epilepsy? Not an issue. There really aren't many issues that would uh, prevent you from getting the vaccine. Uh, epilepsy, you know, actually most of the healthcare conditions that you might have commonly are now eligibility criteria. So those, you know, things like diabetes, asthma, epilepsy, or other neurological diseases, even significant mental illness that's being diagnosed. As of today, we opened eligibility criteria to anybody in those categories. Wow. Uh, pregnant women is another example, uh, people that have had cancer, any kind of immune su suppression, uh, wide range of healthcare conditions will now make you eligible regardless of your age. So epilepsy, no problem. In fact, it's a good reason to go and get the vaccine even quickly. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, doctor. I really appreciate love it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for your question. Now I get to interrupt for a minute because we have some questions that are online. Okay. 
Um, there's two questions online. The first of which is, are the vaccines safe for breastfeeding moms? Yeah, for sure. The vaccines are definitely safe for breastfeeding moms. It's, it's encouraged. Uh, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada has highly recommended vaccination for anyone who's pregnant or breastfeeding. In fact, if you're breastfeeding, there's a good chance that getting the vaccine might help protect your baby as well because of the antibodies that can pass through the breast milk into the baby. So that's a definitely a good thing to do. The second question we're asked is, what allergies cause reactions when taking the vaccine? Yeah, so uh, it would be any kind, of re any kind of allergy to any of the components of the vaccines. Those would be extremely rare uh, allergies. Things that you'd probably know about because they would have been associated with some kind of uh, allergy to a previous vaccine that might have similar components. There is uh, one uh, chemical that is in some uh, makeup products that if you've ever had a reaction of makeup product, you want to look into that. We screen everybody at the time of their appointment to make sure they don't have any of the relevant allergies. If somebody does have an allergy, they can still potentially get the vaccine. It's just that we would refer them to an allergist so they, it can be done in a safe place with proper medical supervision and consultation. Okay. That's it for now. Okay, I wanted to touch on some of the questions that they had. So when it comes to the side effects, are these studies because of how quickly it was made? And of course, there's, it sounds like there has been a lot of participants when it comes to the study, a variety of participants. But how do we know it's safe long term if there hasn't even been time to develop um, to be able to assess and analyze the data of the long term effects? of these vaccines? Really? Is that a risk that we're taking? Yeah, so I, I appreciate the question. And the answer is really around how much data we have because of the large number of people that we've signed up very quickly for these trials. And now, you know, six months worth of data of vaccinating in the real world. The data around vaccine safety isn't just in the clinical trials. So we had these huge trials, 40,000 people in the mm -hmm. trials, in each of the trials. But we also have um, around the world, you have systems that capture safety data mm -hmm. uh, from even after the vaccine's gone into the market. So let's say there was something that was missed in the trial. It gets picked up in those real world studies because you're giving the vaccine now to, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world. And that's how the blood clots associated with AstraZeneca came up, for example. When you look at vaccine safety and the history of vaccine safety, there aren't really long-term effects that don't show up in the relatively short term. It's just not something that has happened. And again, there are worldwide systems to track safety. Whenever there's um, any kind of adverse event, any kind of negative health impact after a vaccine, the physician involved is obliged to report that to public health so it can be investigated. And, you know, it, it, as you can imagine, let's say in Canada, we give the vaccine to, uh, all of the population, 35 million people. You're getting at people in any given week, they're gonna pass away from various reasons. Right, right. So those deaths would get reported if it happens to be you know, within a week or two of the vaccine, it, those deaths will get reported and they get investigated. And if the rate is above the baseline, well, it's a safety flag. We haven't had anything like that. Uh, with the exception of the blood clots, nothing like that anywhere in the world. And certainly not with any of the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna which are the only two that we have in the mass clinics right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and when it comes to uh, also just access to these studies, do we have access to the studies and how the studies were conducted? And like just that information, do we as a people have access to that? Yeah, so for sure. The Pfizer and Moderna studies, um, those are published in detail. Uh, you've got the, the US FDA data, um, has been made public. The, uh, and then this, the trials have also been published in the top medical journals, The Lancet and JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association. So those data are available for you know, anyone that wants to look at how the study was conducted. Mm -hmm. And then the, the safety data is also reported publicly as well. Okay. So you know, that's why you're seeing today, the f provincial governments made a decision to hold AstraZeneca uh, from being given anymore. Again, very minor, very uncommon side effect of blood clots, 
but they've just decided, you know, we've got enough of these other vaccines. We don't need to use AstraZeneca right. anymore. Let's keep going, all, firing on all cylinders with right. the mRNA vaccines. Okay. Another question. On the well, we got about three, so I'm going to get to the first one. It's um, with today's announcement of AstraZeneca being paused in Ontario, and supply and the supply issues that go along with it. How is that going to affect vaccine targets and goals? Great question. It's not going to affect them very much, mainly because most of the AstraZeneca that was delivered to Canada has already been administered. So in Ontario, you know, there were about 900,000 AstraZeneca vaccines that were delivered. And it's, you know, the data that I've seen, it's between seven and 800,000 have already been delivered. So it, AstraZeneca was never envisioned to be a big part of the Canadian vaccine campaign. Uh, and, and now that most of the, the doses that have been delivered have already been administered, given to patients, it, it really doesn't take a lot of supply out of the picture. Okay. Next question is, if you had a reaction to the flu shot, okay, what would prevent you from getting further flu shots? Would you, and would you stay away from getting the vaccine? Yeah, so there isn't a whole lot of crossover between the flu shot and this vaccine. But it would be important to talk with your, your family doctor. Uh, you could also, if needed, be referred to an allergist who could give some specialist advice about that. And how effective are the vaccines against variants? Yeah, so the variants of concern uh, have really emerged over kind of the last six months or so. The UK variant was one of the first to hit Canada. Most of the variants that we've had here in Middlesex and London and across Ontario have been the UK variant. Uh, the UK, the variants are more a factor in terms of how COVID spreads more easily. We haven't seen great data that the, that the uh, vaccines are not effective against them. All the data we have show that they develop appropriate antibodies uh, to all of the variants. Uh, we have more data around the variants that are more common, like the UK variant, and, and it's showing up that the, the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, have been very effective against the variants. Okay, and, and what about the, in the variant from India? Yeah, variant from India, it's really uh, an open question right now. The, there isn't a lot of data in India with people who have been vaccinated. So we, we don't have a great answer to that question, but again, there's no reason to suspect that it wouldn't have at least some effectiveness. Okay. This question was asked to me um, a little bit after the show last week, and it was in the form of what effects does the vaccine have against um, your DNA? There's so many, there's a few people around that um, they talk about it being able to alter your, your DNA and all that stuff. And I want you to clear up if there's any misconceptions, if there's anything, what exactly does it affect your DNA and how does it affect your DNA? Yeah, the, the, the vaccine does not affect your DNA. What it does is it uh, brings into your cells the ability to produce the um, spike protein, which is essentially the flag for your body that the COVID is there. So you get the ability to produce the pro protein, which teaches your body how to react to it. And so it, it doesn't change your DNA at all. Uh, you know, I got the vaccine in January. I haven't grown a third eye yet. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, th th there just isn't any evidence at all that the vaccine changes your DNA. And then with with there being not enough, well, there's there's a lot of talk also of the amount of time that it um, it's taken to, um, well, to the shortness of the time that it's taken to not only develop but put it out there. Yeah. Um, there's concerns of, you know, five years down the road, six years down the road, 10 years down the road, we're going to, we're going to discover that, you know, this, that third eye, that third leg, that, you know, there's a lot of that also out there. What guarantees, and is there anything, is there guarantees that 10 years down the road, there won't be any serious side effects? Yeah. So the, the reason it takes many vaccines years to be approved is because it takes people a lot of time to, first of all, recruit subjects into the vaccine studies, and second of all, to accumulate enough data, to gather enough data to show that there are, you know, this rate of infection in the people that get vaccinated versus that rate of infection in people who don't. 
In this situation, it was very easy to recruit people. Everybody wanted to sign up for these trials. So you easily got your 35, 40,000 people into the studies. And then because we're in the middle of a pandemic, this virus is circulating a lot. So it was very quickly, you saw the difference between the vaccinated and unvaccinated group where the vaccinated group was getting infected at a fairly high rate and the unvaccinated, sorry, vaccinated group was not getting infected <laughs> and the unvaccinated were getting infected at a very high rate. Mm -hmm. So it, basically we were able to gather many years worth of data very quickly. The way, you know, an analogy I would use is if you're building your house, you know, you, you go and try and build your house by yourself. It might take many months or maybe in a year. You invite 40,000 of your friends over to help build the house and you can do it in a day. And that's what we've done here with these vaccines. We've gathered enough data that it's equivalent to years of study. Okay. And this question, I think, Ivodi and I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it's also come in there. In the last week, there have been people talking about natural health. Um, how does that fare against the vaccines? Um, it seems that the conversation with governments worldwide, with health departments, it's get the vaccine, get the vaccine. But they're not talking about all the other things that, that you could also be doing. Um, they're also not talking about the side effects of everybody being cooped up, which is um, not being able to exercise the way they do, not being able to absorb vitamin D. We had a doctor on, on I believe about three weeks ago, we have a, we have a, a naturopath and, and she does a show once a month and she talks about, you know, things like vitamin D. And one of the, one of the um, thoughts that she, she, well, one of the facts that she brought up is that the, the sun, first of all, being able to go outside in the sun and absorb vitamin D and vitamin D helps with your Im immune system, right? And people are saying, well, they're saying if, if you're cooped up, you can't exercise, you can't do this, then you're also helping, you're helping the virus as opposed to helping the vaccine. Uh, great points. Uh, vitamin D is definitely an issue. It's hard to get when you're not outside. Uh, milk products in Canada do have vitamin D in them, so that helps. But uh, it's a particular issue for people with black skin because it makes it harder to absorb vitamin D from the sun. Uh, that, that is uh, definitely a concern. The, you know, exercise is huge both for your physical health as well as your mental health. And that's been a, a big loss and a big, especially for kids who are stuck at home and not able to go to school. That's been a major, major impact through the pandemic. The, and also vaccines and medicines make a difference too. So, you know, I'm a believer in public health. We, we do believe in prevention. We believe in healthy living, in, in making sure you're eating a balanced diet. Uh, and also when, I, when we get a broken arm, we go to the hospital to get a cast on. That's the situation here. Absolutely, we wanna do those healthy behaviors. We wanna make sure we're getting enough vitamin D and also take those other steps like uh, getting the vaccine. Then my last, I mean, outside of you saying that here, the general message is vaccine. You hardly, you don't hear, okay, guys, you know what? Those of you that are able to, I know we're in a lockdown, but try to, you know, promote the, 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 the physical exercise, like you said. Um, a lot of immigrants, and I'm gonna talk about from the, once again, from the black perspective, whether you come from Africa or whether you come from the Caribbean, we're used to being outside, we're used to, walking we're used to running we're used to just being um i think on a whole we live a little a little bit healthier lifestyle in the sense of of whereas in north america it became you know in the last 10 years or so you see everybody jumping on the health kick but we you know from we're born we're up and we're out and we're we're doing stuff so it's it's not something that we had to get used to or start or anything we're just conditioned that way and so now when when, especially when you get into the, the older demographic and you start telling them, well, you gotta be inside and you're gonna be sick, but, and you're gonna hear some comments, well, I was healthy, I was, you know, but you're cooping me up and this and that and all the, and the, all the other aspects. And like I said, the, the other, this message that you just said, the things that you just said, it's not being emphasized enough. And is that by, is that by choice? Is that because, is that because, um, you just overwhelmingly want people to take the vaccine? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Uh, and I think we could do better to emphasize the importance of exercise and being outside. Uh, you know, completely agree with you there. Uh, one thing that I can say is that we should be through this pandemic or largely through it fairly soon. Within the next couple of months, if we can get the rate of vaccination up to, you know, 75, 80%, that we're going to have this largely under control and we can get back to all of those healthy behaviors. You know, you mentioned being outside and getting exercise, but gathering with family and friends is a big part of people's mental health as well. We've got to get back to that. Uh, vaccine is part of the path there. So the questions that we have online, um, I'm just going to appeal to it. Once again, people, as you're listening to the show, if you have any questions, you can hit us up at evomm3.com. Just click the Evo TV, log in, ask your questions, or you can call in at 519-694-3429. Back to my host, to the host, Ms. Ivodi Vashangi. So, I really like the analogy that you used when it came to how the vaccine works. Um, and so now I wanna ask, how does the vaccine work in your body after you've had COVID-19 and um, now you've built up those antibodies or um, you have a strong immune system um, and how does that affect um, when the virus gets in contact? So you gave the analogy of, okay, the vaccine creates um, these antibodies, I can't explain it the way he did, but <laughs> um, but now when it comes to getting COVID and how does the an antibody work and would you still need the vaccine if you had COVID already or tested positive? And then also when it comes to building um, a, a healthy, strong immune system, how would that work when you get in contact with the, with the COVID? Yeah, great, great question. So if you've had COVID and actually any coronavirus, the, there are many coronaviruses and we have many years of experience with them. Uh, the immunity to coronaviruses that are naturally acquired, so that means through an infection, doesn't last very long. It might last for a few months, but then it kind of, it wanes. You don't have as much uh, immunity, uh, whether it's antibodies or the cellular immunity. Same thing with influenza. That's why you gotta get a flu shot every year uh, part of it is that your, your, your immunity wanes over time. Uh, and so that's the case with the naturally acquired infections. You've, even if you've had COVID over the last you know, year and a bit since the pandemic began, the vaccine will still give you an additional level of immunity and protection mm -hmm. against any further infections. Can you explain that more with an analogy? Because what I understood was um, it teach what your as antibodies, your body now learns how to fight this infection. So how does it all of a sudden, six months, it doesn't know anymore? Um, whereas with the vaccine, um, it stays. So what's the difference between the two? Well, it's, uh, I would see it as reminding your body how to fight this thing that you've already beaten off. Uh, it's not entirely clear whether the vaccine immunity will last longer than the natural immunity. It may be that even after your second dose of vaccine, you've got to get another one in six months. It may be that it becomes an annual vaccine. We don't know that yet. Yeah. Um, but at this point, we know that for people that have had COVID, the vaccine will really increase your, your uh, antibodies and your T cell immunity. And that can be measured in, in a clinical setting. It's easy to show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, when it comes to uh, just off of what um, uh, Collins was saying, uh, there are people who are skeptical because of how they are bombarded with so much information about the vaccine when as they wait for the vaccine, um, like our promotional vid video, we were talking to some youth within the community um, that their mental health, their health, their overall health um, is really waning and it's affecting them. And just that fear of if I get COVID now, I don't think I'm strong enough to even beat it, you know. So there's not a lot of information as you wait. Um, I know you do have, I'm going to let you give some information on 
the news on who's eligible, but as we wait for all of us to be, to be vaccinated, um, how, where do we go for information on how to build our immune system? Because without that information there, it's almost as if we're only being forced to make one decision. I'm not saying that people don't want to take the vaccine, but when they don't have enough information for them to choose, just like how if, if I'm told this is your only option, I'll be like, I don't want to do it. You know, whereas I want to be able to make, you know, we want to be able to make um, our own choices. As a mother myself, I'm, you know, I'm looking at all the data, I'm getting as much information as possible and I want to make the, the healthiest decisions for my children not just for the future um, but for right now I want to live t for tomorrow too you know and the next day after that um, how can where do we go for that information to um, in this quarantine time during this lockdown we are home where do you go for that information on how to just build our immune system before we can even get the vaccine if that's what we want to do yeah so I mean Eating healthy, getting good exercise and rest all contribute to a positive immune system. Uh, there's nothing new or different about that. Mm -hmm. That's the same advice we would give people in any, in any situation. Uh, I could tell you if there were some magic bullet, you know, if yoga three <laughs> times a day, we're going to prevent COVID, we'd be recommending that. Right, right. We're definitely in that business. And of course, you know, the public health measures about avoiding indoor gatherings with people from outside mm -hmm. of your household. Uh, wearing a mask when you do need to be in public, all of those things we know do make a difference. And those are the things that people can re-emphasize with their families in the meantime. Okay, um, so in a way it kind of sounds like just wait for the vaccine. Well, I mean, wait for the vaccine, but also, yeah, do take care of yourself. Uh, three meals a day, get a good rest, uh, right. sleep well, and avoid gathering. Right, right, but is there anything that the health unit can do to help us while we are waiting, you know, because that's what that's why I really that I'm seeing a lot, especially with the youth. The youth are really, they are really going through it when it comes to stress, mental health, yeah. and all of this, um, causing them to become a lot more weaker. Also, um, do you think there's anything that the health unit can do um, to help that, or is it just out of your hands? Well, I, I wish there were. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one thing that we're hoping is that schools can open sooner yeah. so that the kids can start getting back, you know, having some level of contact with each other yeah. uh, and start get the, getting their lives somewhat back to normal. Yeah, I yeah. think that would really help a lot of definitely, people, definitely. including some of those parents who are trying to help those kids with online right, school and right. also do their work. That can be pretty stressful too. Yeah. Do you have children? I do have three little girls. How here. are you liking online school? <laughs> <laughs> liking is a strong term. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. right, right. Definitely challenging. Um, we have another question. Okay. And this question is um, the emphasis on servicing the black community. It seems that now in, in and people are equating it to the fact of, of and we're going to go back to the George Floyd and all that stuff. It seems now there's an emphasis in all aspects of, of, of Canada, Canadian life, that they're placing emphasis on the black community. Now, when this subsides, what's there to say that the, the um, not only the Middlesex Health Unit or any other health units across Canada will continue to place an emphasis and the reason this question is so relevant and I'm glad it's being asked is because there is a lack of trust in certain institutions and even though the health department is supposed to be for there's still a lack of trust there so now um, there are people that feel that just because of, of, of the temperature of the moment that's why you know it's okay we can pay attention to the black community and to marginalized communities now but when history has shown that before that it hasn't really happened, what's to what's to, to um, what's to say that okay, so we've got we've gotten the vaccines, everything's back to normal. We don't need to pay attention to whether it's the black or marginalized communities. Yeah, it's a really good question and, and a great point. I think that you know the George Floyd moment was a really important moment for our organization and for, for many in, in, in Canada and around the world. Uh, what we're doing to try and make sure that our organization can stay interested, involved, and engaged in addressing those issues is that we're building that right into our strategy. So we're in the process, we've just renewed our strategic plan. 
and we've made addressing anti-black racism a core part of our strategic plan. So it's a core part of the Middlesex London Health Unit strategic plan. We, we've uh, engaged an external consultant who's a black woman from Hamilton, ex excellent uh, analyst who's done work with our community uh, at, uh, and looking at the experiences of people within the organization. We've also had another separate team of experts associated with Western University who are, peop who are black people in, in this community who've given advice about what the Middlesex London Health Unit's role can be to address anti-black racism in the broader community outside of our organization. Uh, so we're doing our best and, and those come with sets of recommendations that we can measure over time and report to the public on. So I would encourage you to you know, stay interested in what is happening in Middlesex London Health Unit. We're going to be public about it all uh, and we hope that you know, in a year or two from now, if we're not you know, living up to expectations, that somebody can be asking tough questions and helping to right. get us back on track. Right. Well, that's what we're here for. We will hold you accountable. <laughs> that, and now I'm going to ask this question, and this is on behalf of not anybody online. This is an, this is an EVO question. Um, how does the health department plan on addressing the lack of... Um, I want to say employment opportunities, but it might not necessarily be employment opportunities. What it might be is more of people are not interested because one, if you don't see somebody that looks like you, right, then you're not thinking health, let me get into this, right? And then when you see, when you see people like you, you don't normally see them in positions of higher than, you know, in, in in certain right. positions, I should say, in certain positions. And then you wonder, is it because they don't have the qualifications is, is, is there? And then you hear stories and, and um, we're a new organization, but along the way, we're tapping into the stories that are in our community and that's part of what we are about. Um, we, we've done a lot of interviews. We have a show called My Community and My Community taps into um, individuals in the community doing things um, and a lot of the stories especially in terms of education the, the, the hurdles that they have to go through just to qualify right um, and I think it's not just from the black community I think um, it used to be from Southeast Asia as well you hear the stories of um, doctors lawyers Africa coming here um, right. nurses and they have to go through a set of qualifications and sometimes um, it's just strenuous and you have to you have to suffer to get to get mm -hmm. through i know a nurse that used to work in 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 st thomas and she came here from south africa i believe about 30 years ago and she told me of the, the just the difficulties and if it wasn't for determination and just trying to prove a point she would have given up but and i'm going to say that's 30 years ago but here we are now in in 2021 What's being done to encourage minorities, whether, once again, whether it's the black community, whether it's the Asian community, whether it's the um, Aboriginal community, what's being done to encourage people and to enter the, the, the medical field? And not just PSAs mm -hmm. or, you know, just right. really, really to go farther. What's, is, there, is there a recruitment campaign? Is there... Is there anything being, being um, and I should say that we should be targeted because we're the communities that right. need the representation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, well, our organization has recognized the importance of representation. Uh, we have a history of success in this with our uh, indigenous reconciliation program. We were able to bring an indigenous leader into the organization as a great representation representative. Um, and and we, we now have a set of recommendations from an external uh, consultant who I mentioned, who is a, a black woman uh, and an expert in this area and how to grow diversity within an organization. And those recommendations include things like um, uh, making sure that you uh, are expressly setting a goal of increasing diversity, making sure that interview questions don't have a cultural bias making sure that there's a standardization to our hiring processes that, uh, that don't generate some of those uh, or reproduce some of the personal biases that many of us have without even knowing it, uh, making sure that we uh, eliminate parts of our hiring process that might require 
you know, a certain type of degree when a life experience or, or work experience might be equivalent. Uh, so we have a set of recommendations that we're in the process of implementing on all of that. And, and I think, you know, it's well heard that, that uh, no amount of talk or goodwill will replace representation. I just got to make um thank you for reminding me of the word. I was searching for it, so let me apologize. I used Aboriginal instead of Indigenous, and in this day and age, it, the word is the correct terminology I should have used is Indigenous. I do apologize. Thank you, Dr. Mackey, for for correct not cor for correcting me just by saying it, because I was actually searching for the word and couldn't remember. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to I want to as we're closing out the show. I want to. Uh, give you the opportunity to speak to now um, those who are ready to take the vaccine. Um, where, who's eligible right now? Where can they take these vaccines? Um, when can they take them? And also, if you can speak a bit about our children, um, do our children have to be vaccinated? Can they be vaccinated? For sure. So right now, everyone older than 50 is eligible as of Thursday the what will that be the uh, 13th of may it'll be everyone over 40 so a big additional group the following thursday everyone over 30 and then the, by the 27th of may all adults everyone over 18 will be eligible in the meantime we also have the large groups i mentioned healthcare conditions uh, anyone who's essential workers who can't work from home uh, which includes people who work in fast factories people who work in restaurants people uh, who is teachers, uh, taxi drivers, all of those essential workers who can't work from home are now eligible as well. And uh, that's as of today. So the, the easiest way to keep track of eligibility is at healthunit.com, uh, the Middlesex London Health Unit webpage, healthunit.com. And we're following the provincial eligibility in lockstep now. So if you're eligible here, pretty sure you're eligible across the province. Uh, so check out healthunit.com. Awesome, awesome. Um, and to just end on a lighter note, I'd like to know, because um, obviously, yes, you are a, um, you know, you're the medical officer of health and all that, but you're also, you know, an individual. Um, what is your biggest takeaway? Um, what is your biggest lesson um, that between 2020 and 2021, um, COVID-19, the health unit, uh, as a father, you know, as someone within the community, what has it taught you? Wow, lot, lots of lessons, but the most important one is how important family is, uh, how hard it is to miss them. You know, I've been trying very hard to go see my parents at their their place mm -hmm. in Quebec, and every time we set that up, you know, Thanksgiving, we had the yes, second wave coming, yes. Christmas, same thing. Yes. Uh, you know, we were supposed to have spring break get up there. Real uh, missed opportunities, but uh, looking forward to, my parents are vaccinated now, mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing them as soon as we can. Awesome, awesome. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for being here in the studio with us and sure. answering all of our questions, our phone calls, our chat. Um, we really appreciate it. <laughs>